You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. We're back once again with another offering from the fabulous American author, Donald Wandre. This classic weird tale, which first appeared in Esquire magazine in its April 1942 edition, goes by the provocative title, It Will Grow On You. We hope you enjoy it, folks. It Will Grow On You by Donald Wandre He couldn't find the compass in the centre drawer. Maybe he hadn't left it at his office after all. Next, he tried poking among the litter of medical journals, cancelled checks, and brochures about new equipment in the top right-hand drawer. Underneath lay his automatic, but no compass. He wondered briefly if it would be worthwhile to take the thirty-eight along on the hunting trip. He gave up searching. The time he'd wasted would have bought a dozen compasses. The bell in the reception room rang, and he became conscious again of the cool, conditioned air inside, of the fever pulse of the city outside that he'd escape tomorrow. He had finished with all appointments for the day. He had so arranged his patience and operating schedule as to permit him a week's absence. The bell, he hoped, would signify no more than a minor case— or an emergency treatment. The door opened, and he glanced past the portable examination table. For a moment, the nurse, in insufferable white, was framed between many hued bottles of medicines and rows of surgical tools in the wall cabinets. She blanked out all but small segments of the outer room, the cream leather edge and chromium arm of a chair, the robin's egg blue of a wall, the fat nap of a broadloom in avocado green, the corner of a Hawper's original oil painting, July Moon. She closed the door and leaned against it, and her face looked as chalky as her uniform. A stranger, she said, a man in a raincoat. Raincoat? He stared toward the window, where shadows deepened in the canyon, but the great stone man wore an opposite shimmered as though melting from sunfire. One of those swagger coats with a belt, she added foolishly. It hangs all the way down to his shoes. What's the matter with him? He won't say, except that it's urgent. Who sent him here? A ship's doctor. Strange. I don't know any ship's doctors. You've no idea what his trouble is? She hesitated, her lower lip curling inward between her teeth. His coat flapped as he was coming in. Something is seriously wrong. The most peculiar thing. Very well. Send him in. She looked faint, as though she would slide down the door and dissolve into something liquid. I won't need you, he said. You may go. She nodded dumbly and went out, with a kind of sidling motion around the man who entered. Her face was developing a greenish tinge. He stepped toward her, but she shook her head mechanically, with an expression of terror and a queer shine in her eyes. A line of sweat beads bubbled on her forehead. He eyed her closely as she pulled the door shut. Perhaps it would be well to observe her condition during the next few weeks. For a moment his attention was distracted. He heard, or seemed to hear, a faint, muffled twittering, like the cry of a bird. He looked toward the window, but there was nothing there, not even a sparrow on the ledge outside. He cocked his head, straining, but did not hear the sound again. Yet he remained vaguely on edge, and wondered if some small animal might possibly have been trapped between the walls of the office. The muted closing of the outer door told him that Nurse had gone. She had stayed later than usual. He was satisfied to have dismissed her. The patient was an irregular, and whatever the trouble would be diagnosed, treated, or referred quickly. The man wore a swagger coat a tan all-weather that hung to his shoes. His hands were thrust deep in the pockets. His face was burnt dark, but the skin stretched tightly across cheekbones and around nostrils and eyes. A curious pallor underlay the tan, a dusty greyness. His eyes held a glow, 
as though he kept going only by some flickering but intense fire from within. His voice, when he spoke, also had a strangeness. It was flat and dead, with a huskiness on the edge of exhaustion. It came with the precise slowness of one using an unfamiliar language, or reciting a role from memory. He said, I am very grateful. I have heard that the best specialists are not always so easy to see. He hesitated, added quickly, Your fee, doctor, will be paid at once and in full. Be seated. You're rather fortunate. My calendar is generally crowded, but I happen to be going off on a hunting trip tomorrow. So I hope the hunting will be good, very good. The stranger looked relieved. That is excellent. I, too, am leaving tomorrow morning. I have booked passage on a ship. A sea voyage is an excellent remedy for a good many ailments. What seems to be the trouble? The smouldering eyes appraise the examination table. You could perform an operation here, a small operation. It is not my usual custom, but you could do it, in an emergency. It all depends on the circumstances. A faint buzz distracted him, and he noticed with extreme irritation that a blue bottle fly had somehow got into the office. He supposed the insect must have entered along with the patient, or possibly when the nurse was leaving. "'Excuse me for a moment,' he said brusquely, "'while I bring the wildlife under control. This is most unusual.' He took a sprayer out of the bottom drawer, but when he looked, the fly was nowhere visible. As he heard that same muffled twittering, the hairs rose along his forearms. "'What was that?' he asked. "'What was what?' said the stranger. That sound! I heard nothing. Nothing except a fly buzzing around. The doctor put his spray pump aside, but he was positive that twice he had heard an indefinable sound. Yes, it must have been the fly, he agreed. Now, what did you say your trouble was? The stranger began to unbutton the swagger coat. I must warn you to prepare yourself. I am always prepared said the doctor, a trifle coldly. I mean, you must be prepared for a shock, perhaps a very great shock. When Dr. Kelman advised me, you had no equals. Dr. Kelman? Who's he? He was the ship's surgeon of the SS Maracaibo. I see. You landed recently? This very afternoon. I believe you said you intend to board ship again tomorrow? It is imperative that I do so. But a different vessel, of course. Hmm. If your trouble is really serious, he broke off with a feeling of suffocation, as though he had swallowed his tongue. The visitor tossed his coat aside. Underneath, he wore a white suit. The jacket was wrinkled and sweat-soaked. The left trouser leg was cut off near the hip, just below the pocket. The seam opened to his waist and crudely fastened with a couple of safety pins. Between crotch and knee and mid-thigh stood an enormous bandage. It was this bandage that sent a sharp tingle of unease through him, for the covering shook and undulated, as though something alive were inside, something that scurried round and round in search of a way out. The movement ceased almost at once. He had the eerie feeling that whatever was within had sensed itself to be under observation. He reached out to unwind the tape but the man settled himself in an office chair. He propped his bare leg on the footrest, and unfastened a huge safety pin that secured the ends of the bandage. "'Permit me,' he said. "'I have had some experience with this. It is not entirely—safe. But this Dr. Kelman you mentioned. The bandage is not his work. Even a ship's surgeon would not have done such a ragged job. I wound it on, and I will take it off.' But surely Dr. Kelman— Oh, he tried to help, but he— Ah, uh, injured his hands. The stranger's thick fingers worked slowly, tensely, at unwinding the tape. He used both hands, but alternately, always leaving one hand free and half clenched. It was impossible to tell whether he was preparing to pounce or to ward off a blow. The ship's doctor, Kelman, did not write out a diagnosis? He intended to, but he disappeared. He what? It was a strange event. The patient worked more slowly now. 
He would pass the tape down under his thigh, snatch it swiftly with his free hand, and just as swiftly jerk the released hand back, always expectantly poised, half offensive, half defensive. Kelman was a curious fellow. He claimed he suffered terribly from sinus trouble when on land, but he developed a chronic state of indigestion which would clear up only when he set foot on land. The sinus trouble affected him most, so he took his sensitive stomach out to sea permanently, and became a ship's surgeon. He was a good one, though not for me. I saw Kelman last night. He spent an hour or more working on me. At one point the knife slipped, and he gashed his hand quite badly. He said he would think about the case overnight, and write me a report or prescription this morning. But he seems to have vanished during the night. You are positive? The ship was searched in every conceivable place. He left no message, no clue? None. The captain will report that Kelman was lost overboard, under circumstances unknown. The doctor asked, and he was unable to keep the growing uneasiness out of his voice, "'You think there may have been some connection between your trouble and Kelman's disappearance?' "'I do not know. Suppose you go back a little and tell me the symptoms of this—this whatever it is.' "'I am not entirely sure about it myself,' said the patient slowly, without raising his head. "'I am afraid what I have to tell you will not help very greatly. For some time I have been on a mission of a most confidential nature.' "'Where?' "'You said you had just arrived by boat?' "'I am not at liberty to tell,' said the patient stiffly. "'My work required me to visit many places. I have recently spent several months in a rather isolated locality. There was a native girl. We had an understanding, or so I thought. A man's needs are the same wherever he is.' "'I can imagine,' said the doctor dryly. "'A couple of weeks ago I told her I must leave. She wanted to go with me. That was, of course, impossible. She had gotten herself pregnant. She was very unreasonable, fought like a wild one. She had a knife in her hand suddenly, and before I could seize it, she had slashed both of us. She kept screaming something in her own tongue, to the effect that her blood was mine, that she was now part of me, and that she would go with me always. Then she broke loose and ran out, but when I got to the door, she had already sped into the jungle. My worst cut was on the upper thigh. After bandaging it, I got on my horse and rode toward the village, intending to have the wounds cleaned and dressed. I had not gone far, when my horse shied at something I never saw. I received a blow from a branch overhead, felt myself falling. The next thing I knew it was dark, and I lay on the floor of my house. I saw ashes of a fire at my feet and smelled a pungent, bitter sweetness in the air. There were spots of fresh blood, too. I found, also, that I had changed. I could not consult the local doctor, for if word went around of what had happened to me, I would be an outcast. My usefulness would be ended. The same reason prevented me from moving on to my next assignment, which was also among rather primitive people. I took the first boat north, hoping that the ship's surgeon would be able to treat me in privacy, and at a safe distance to see. "'That's a curious story,' mused the doctor. "'You'll pardon me if I say I hardly know what to believe. That is of no importance. All that I care about now is the operation. But it will not be easy.' He unwound the last of the tape. A pillowcase lay underneath, twisted around the thigh. He loosed its corners— and flung it aside, with a jerky but practised motion that left both hands cupped, veins bulging up. There was a great purplish splotch on the skin. The ankles were rooted in its centre, tiny ankles that flowed into the rudiments of feet that merged with the flesh. She could not have been more than a foot tall, a miniature and sinuous Venus, a perfect figurine exquisitely formed in each minute detail— like a doll, but perilously alive. Her body seemed at moments nut-brown, then changing to a sort of metallic sheen, the colour of old bronze overlain with a pattern of verdigris. Her eyes were closed. Her face had the vacant repose of an idiot child. 
She opened her eyes and looked at the doctor. He got up and walked over to the window. There came a foolish little twittering from behind. Sam Force, stronger than his will, turned him around. The small horror was talking in a language that he did not know. She was cooing upward at her host with mindless adoration, and straining tautly upon her rooted feet, as though attempting to leap into his arms. "'What is she—what is it—saying?' he asked in a faraway tone. "'I do not hear anything. Do you know what dialect it is?' I do not hear anything. His eyes flickered briefly. The doctor had an impression of having looked, through a curtain momentarily drawn, upon great fires raging in some illimitable void. Sweat was pouring down his cheeks. The doctor said, Just stretch out on the table and relax. He washed his hands thoroughly, and put on a smock, but decided against rubber gloves. His palms already felt warm and moist. We'll have that growth taken off right now. It should be a fairly easy and almost painless operation. He laid out a row of scalpels and scissors, sutures, surgical thread, antiseptics. He sterilized the needle of a hypodermic syringe, tested the plunger, and filled the chamber with Novocaine. Gelman tried everything. The man appeared to be talking to himself. He couldn't get rid of her. I don't think anybody can. "'Nonsense. I'll fix you up in no time,' promised the doctor. He thought, "'That ass of a ship's surgeon probably couldn't treat a carbuncle, let alone remove an abnormal growth.' He became conscious of a buzz again. The blue-bottle fly had returned. It circled over the man on the table, and sailed down past the tawny figurine. It got no farther. A small, supple arm swooped outward— the snared fly made a shriller hum. There was a flash of teeth, as tiny as the points of an ivory comb, a dreadful smacking of the rosebud mouth. He walked over to the table, and swabbed the two areas of injection with alcohol. He did not glance directly at the alien thing, but its very nearness made him aware for the first time of its evil force, the exotic temptation that it combined with a singleness of purpose— and a quality that he could not quite identify. "'This may give you a bit of a twinge,' he warned, and lowered the needle. It never penetrated the skin. The whole figure whipped over as if snapped on the end of a lash. The hypodermic was knocked clear out of his grasp, smashed on the floor. "'I begin to see what you mean,' said the doctor softly. "'I'm afraid it won't be possible to use an anaesthetic,' he admitted. "'No.' said the patient. Gelman tried ether. It put me asleep, but it had no effect on that. The primary need, the doctor decided, would be to make the creature impotent, reduce it to an inert state. Surveying the office equipment, his eyes lighted on the glass shell that protected his microscope. The shell stood approximately two feet high, and a foot in diameter. He lifted the glass cover, and warily approached. The patient should be able to hold the shell firmly over the living doll, while he inserted a tube under the edge and turned on the gas. He dropped the glass casing in position. She stood erect within, barely quivering. "'Quick now, hold this,' he told the patient. They almost succeeded. The man slid his hands around the container, and the doctor, releasing his grip, reached for the gas tubing. At that instant— the imprisoned girl seemed weirdly beautiful. Her features had the delicate clarity of a cameo. Her hair looked softer and finer than cobwebs, of a lustrous mahogany hue. Her eyes were hot and glittering. The patient's hands had not quite come to rest with a firm hold, when she doubled up with the boneless and springy ease of live rubber. She curled her fingers under the rim, and jerked. The glass container rose, tilted, the doctor sprang to push it back. The patient bobbled it. The shell tilted around between all hands, then spun free and smashed into countless fragments on the floor. There was a hint of mockery in the poise of that small, naked, and apparently defenceless being. The doctor did not stop to clean up the debris. 
He withdrew to his desk, opened the top right-hand drawer, and took out the automatic. He balanced the weapon as he spoke, but his eyes never left the passive figurine. "'I am a good shot,' he said quietly. "'No, put that down. I won't miss. That's what I am afraid of,' said the patient in a dull voice. He was lying motionless, staring at the ceiling. "'You see, I too am an expert marksman. I have taken out my own forty-five many times in the last two weeks, but I could not bring myself to pull the trigger. I have no scruples. I will accept full responsibility. Will you? Suppose you don't miss. Suppose your bullet goes right through its heart. But what will you do if it does not die?' Slowly, with a trance-like motion, the doctor replaced his automatic in the drawer. A series of desperate expedients fleeted through his mind, of spraying the thing with liquid air till it froze solid and could be snapped off like an icicle, of heaping it with plaster of Paris till it was rigid in a solid block, of destroying it with X-ray therapy. His eyes fell on the row of surgical tools laid out, the scalpels that he did not dare use so long as the figurine remained capable of violent opposition. But the sight of the scalpels gave him the clue to a new possibility. He walked over to the table, and strapped the leg down tight at ankle, knee, and waist. He padded the kneecap with cotton, and taped it for maximum protection, then taped the entire upper leg as closely as he could approach to the rooted feet without interference. When he had finished, the thigh was covered, except for the purplish area, in which the living doll grew. He took a square decanter of whiskey from his cabinet. Here, drink as much of this as you can stand. You'll need it. Thank you. No. I wish to see the end of this, if there is an end. I'm going to operate. It will be quick and direct. It will hurt. If it fails, I am afraid there will be nothing more I can do for you. Will you drink, or will you take an anaesthetic? Thank you. No. Proceed, please. I'll be back in a few moments. He went out into the corridor. A feeling of emptiness gripped him. Some basic part of him had been stolen beyond recovery. Near the stairs, built into the wall— was a fire-alarm box, and beside it hung a short-handled axe, with a blade of almost surgical sharpness. He lifted the axe, and returned to his office. The patient did not seem to know or care what the doctor was doing. He had not touched the whisky. The doctor said, "'Now, grip the sides of the table and hold on hard.' He turned the adjustment crank, until the table slanted at a forty-five-degree angle. The axe had good balance. It was both light enough to be aimed well, and with a heavy enough head to give the bite of the blade a strong momentum. As he tried out the axe in a tentative arc, a torrent of soft cooing and twittering issued from the tiny lips, a sound more dreadful than any cry or protest. She was looking up at her host in an ecstasy of adoration, and her voice was drooling love— the fawning, brainless love of a cretin. That love flowed over and glued the doctor in its mewing fullness. It was an endless well of pure idiot love. It asked not even a gentle caress or an affectionate return. The doctor's hands, which had been so uncomfortably warm, were cold and moist. A hammer began tapping at his temple. He swung the blade— the bright edge went through, streaked with red. There was a convulsion of movement from the severed figurine. Perhaps his foot slipped on crumbs of glass. Perhaps the little creature somehow deflected the blow. Perhaps the swing itself pulled him off balance. For the blade kept going, slashed through smock and trouser, lanced into the flesh alongside his own knee, with a stab of fire. He stumbled, and the metal edge of the table made a thick, ugly sound against his forehead. He sat on the floor, and when he sagged limply backward, his skull bounced with a sodden thud. It was very dark when he groaned and struggled up. Waves of nausea and pain made his head a bursting volcano. His leg ached with burning intensity. He looked toward the window. 
a faint reflection from the streetlights washed the building opposite, but all its apartments were blacked out. It must be midnight or later. He pulled himself to the wall and pushed the switch. The patient had gone. A row of small, round spots like dried blood traversed the floor from the table to the area where he had regained consciousness. The cloth of his suit had soaked up and caked around the deep gash at his knee. She was standing there, in the wound, the little doll, firmly rooted, tiny ankles blending into the form of feet that merged with his flesh. Her eyes were watching him avidly. He stretched out his hands with a sudden, terrible impulse to seize the thing and tear it out. His hands faltered, wavered, and drew back. He could not imagine what it would be like to touch the creature. He could not bring himself to find out. He began dragging himself across the floor until he was able to reach into the top right-hand drawer of his desk. The Southern Cross had made steady way since morning. The sea had been smooth, the day warm, but the occupant of cabin 39 had not come out for either the noon or evening meal. He had bolted his door. He had lain in his berth all day with a fever, dozing for hours. His left leg was swathed in the bandages that he had applied in the doctor's office. It was badly swollen and throbbed maddeningly. After nightfall, he got out the extra bandages that he had brought along. Perhaps he had drawn the first dressing too tight. With a pocket knife, he slit open the bandage along his side, and gingerly lifted it away. A tiny figurine, not yet fully formed, was growing out of the purple patch on his thigh. The figure of a woman blossomed, but with the pale hue of an unfinished fetus. He was beyond horror. He stared at the little living thing with a kind of deliberate finality. He turned toward the porthole and looked out across the dark waters. He seemed to see an infinite series of progressively diminishing creatures who vanished only at the point of eternity. He measured the porthole with his eyes, but his shoulders were too broad. He put the long swagger coat on. It rippled near his knee, even after he buttoned it and drew the belt tight. A thin cry, a high but stifled wail, came from the blanketed shape, unearthly as the note of an elfin flute. He opened the door. A steward was hurrying past. The steward paused. Are you all right, sir? Quite all right. If there is anything I can get you. No. I just thought a short walk would do me good. Very good, sir. Good night. Good night. He watched the steward vanish around a turn. A short walk, he thought. Yes, a very short walk. He thrust his hands deep into his coat pockets, and began climbing the companionway to the open deck. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the Join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.